excuse me, what comes to mind when I say HM-126F? Oh, my. Is that something I should know? Uh, yeah, isn't that a fighter jet or something? Well, I heard some of the guys in the shop talking about it the other day. Something about hazardous minerals or something. HM-126F? Yeah, I've heard of that. But I don't know how or if it would affect our company. We're just a local chemical company. This applies some of the bigger industries in town. It's probably something that shouldn't be discussed in front of children, I'm guessing. Actually, I was just reading about it in the regs here, and uh, I'm a little confused. Uh, can you tell me anything about it? Why was HM-126F written in the first place? The Hazardous Materials Transportation Act, or HMTA, gives the Secretary of Transportation the regulatory and enforcement authority to protect the nation against the risks to life and authority to protect the transportation of hazardous materials and commerce. The Hazardous Materials Transportation Uniform Safety Act of 1990, also known as HMTUSA, amended the HMTA and mandated that the Secretary of Transportation issue regulations which require hazardous materials or hazmat training be provided to hazmat employees involved with the transportation of hazardous materials. Are you still with me? Yeah, sure. Just keep going. The regulations require that persons, that is, hazmat employees, involved with the transportation of hazardous materials receive hazardous materials training. As stated in the hazardous materials regulations, it's the duty of each hazmat employer to comply with the applicable requirements and to thoroughly instruct each hazmat employee in relations thereto. This training may be provided by the hazmat employer or other public or private source. The HM transportation regulations were amended to include detailed, function-specific training requirements by docket HM-126. The reporting of incidents involving hazardous materials showed that human error is the probable cause of most transportation incidents. And because of this, the training requirements proposed in HM-126F were adopted and are now contained in subpart H of part 172 of 49 CFR. These requirements specifically point out the areas in which an employee must be trained. You mentioned hazmat employees. Can you tell me uh, how you define that exactly? A hazmat employee is a person who, while doing their job, directly affects hazardous materials transportation safety. This includes all employees who load, unload, or handle hazardous materials recondition or test containers, drums, or packagings represented for use in the transportation of hazardous materials, or operate vehicles transporting hazardous materials. It also includes an owner-operator of a motor vehicle who transports hazardous materials. There are three major types of required training. The general awareness familiarization training, function-specific training, safety training, and there's also modal-specific training. And you are going to explain those, aren't you? Sure. Let's start with general awareness familiarization training. This training is intended to raise hazmat employees' general awareness. It gives a general knowledge of the regulations and the purpose and meaning of hazard communication requirements. With this training, a hazmat employee should be able to recognize and identify hazardous materials in the workplace. All hazmat employees must receive this training. The next type is function-specific training and it's intended to teach the necessary knowledge, skills, and abilities for an individual's job function. For example, a hazmat employee responsible for filling out hazardous materials shipping papers would be trained in the specific regulations dealing with that subject. The third type is safety training. It provides information concerning the hazards posed by materials in the workplace. It may be under normal conditions or in likely accident scenarios. It includes appropriate personal protection measures and, when necessary, how to use emergency response information, methods, and procedures for avoiding accidents and any remedial actions necessary after a release of hazardous material. This training is for hazmat employees who handle the transport packages containing hazardous materials during the course of transportation, like packers and warehouse workers preparing hazardous materials for transport. It also applies to persons who could be potentially exposed to hazardous materials as a result of a transportation accident. There's also modal-specific training. 
It's intended to provide for the safe operation and handling of hazmat for a specific mode of transportation. Whether the transportation is by air, water, rail, or highway, each mode has specific requirements. The employer is responsible for determining the adequate and appropriate level of training for each hazmat employee. A CDLHM endorsement may or may not satisfy the requirements. The determination of adequate training has been left to the hazmat employer to decide. Okay, so what's the best source for training? The hazmat employer must decide which is best to suit that company's needs, but generally, the training sources are found in-house, through public institutions, or from private groups or individuals. Many larger companies have in-house training programs for fulfilling the requirements. They can customize training for hazmat employees with specific duties. It's a matter of analyzing the job assignment or changes in assignment and providing appropriate training. The company that designed this material makes sure that all hazmat employees are trained for their specific duties dealing with hazardous materials. Most companies are members of associations that provide resources for training and education. Many federal, state, and local agencies offer training in hazardous materials. For example, extensive hazardous materials training is offered by the Transportation Safety Institute in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, for federal, state, and local government employees and industry in all modes of transportation. Cooperation between government and private industry can benefit each other for successful training. Companies can assist enforcement personnel with knowledge of the industry, while industry can learn regulation requirements from knowledgeable enforcement officers and personnel. Training is also available from various colleges and universities throughout the United States. The Federal Highway Administration Office of Motor Carriers has offices in each state that can give you more information. A number of private sources offer training to the general public. The Hazardous Materials Advisory Council is an international non-profit trade association involved in promoting safety and regulatory compliance in the transportation of hazardous material. They offer this type of training both to members and the general public. Also, the American Trucking Associations, a national representative for the trucking industry, is a good source for training seminars, videos, and publications on the transport of HM and other truck safety issues. There's also an electronic bulletin board, the Hazardous Materials Information Exchange, or HMIX, which lists training offered by both public and private organizations. Um, I read something about recurrent training. Uh, what, is, what exactly is that? The recurrent training regulations require that a hazmat employee receive training at least every two years. And this keeps hazmat employees up to date on changes that occur within the industry and changes in the regulations. How does a hazmat employer prove that the training requirements have been met? By the record keeping requirements. A record of current training that includes the last two years must be created and retained by each hazmat employer for each hazmat employee. The details of what individual records should include are contained in section 172.704 of 49 CFR. So why comply? What, what's the incentive to comply with the HM training requirements? Well, for starters, Failure to comply can result in civil and criminal penalties, but more importantly, most hazardous materials incidents are the result of human error. Proper training of the hazmat employees has been shown to decrease the human error factor. Simple things like incompatible packaging and using the wrong shipping name can be the beginning of a major incident. Compliance can help protect a company from liability in case of injury or accident. Can you show me any examples of HM incidents? Unfortunately, there are many examples. In Florida, 12 people were injured and hundreds evacuated when a cargo tank hauling a mixture of waste acid spilled its load at a truck repair shop. It was a case of the wrong container being used to transport the wrong product. The mixture of acids created a violent chemical reaction after coming in contact with the stainless steel container walls. 1,700 gallons of waste acid was spilled onto the ground. The National Transportation Safety Board found that the shipper had failed to specify a proper cargo tank and the carrier failed to tell the shipper what material the tanker could haul. During a routine road check in South Carolina, a truck was inspected. The truck was placarded for hazardous materials. As the inspectors opened the trailer, it's evident that proper blocking and bracing methods were not followed. Near Mountain Home, Idaho, a driver was en route to a waste disposal site. At each corner, the container leaked a milky white substance. The driver was informed of a leak coming from his container. He proceeded after stuffing a t-shirt into the hole, yet it was still leaking when he arrived at the disposal site. There are many other incidents on record, all of which could have been prevented with proper training of personnel. 
Now I'm starting to understand, I'm starting to get a grip here of why these requirements are so important. But I'm wondering, um, what are other companies doing? How are other companies implementing these training rules? We talked to a company about how they're complying with training regulations. We generally haul paints and batteries and uh, some isopropanol alcohol, things like that. Uh, they go through a film training, and that takes about an hour and a half. And then from there,